Awesome. All righty. Well, in the uh, EDM pop there. Um, so first off, thank you all for hopping in uh, this evening for another session of our virtual entrepreneurship toolkit series. This is our fourth session of five. So we're really excited to have those of you back and maybe some new faces or uh, Zoom, Zoom names uh, on your screen for us. So we're excited to have you here tonight. My name is Cameron Law and I'm the executive director of the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And we serve as a regional hub and platform for, for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, community, and support to really focus on supporting startup founders of all backgrounds to explore and launch their businesses. And we have, have this mission to membership pervader side region and really trying to build this region to be a premier hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. And how we've gone about operationalizing that mission and vision is by looking at the entrepreneurial journey in kind of three main sectors, discover by building those on ramps into that entrepreneurial journey, our build programs by empowering you as entrepreneurs to get the mindsets, the tools and the ability to be able to take an idea and go about building it. And then our launch phases, which are really helping you take those ideas, um, have that successful business model and go to scale. And so tonight is part of our build programs. Um, this is our, I think, fifth round of our virtual entrepreneurship toolkit series. So this was in response to the pandemic back in uh, March of last year. And we're excited to have our fifth iteration of the program. So tonight we're going to be tackling uh, revenue streams, cost structures, key metrics, and financial projections. And joining us tonight to help us with financial projections, we have Roger Godfrey, who's the SVP and Senior Relationship Manager at California Bank of Commerce. We're really excited to have the California Bank of Commerce as one of our um, par partners for our mentor network. They've helped invest in, in us to really bring about mentorship in the greater Sacramento region. So we're really thankful for their support and for his support here tonight. Uh, before I pass it over to Brian to, to get us going in those revenues and um, cost structures conversation, um, a little bit of housekeeping. We would love to have conversation going through the chat, asking questions of any of the content that you're seeing um, or something that you're not um, getting and, and something that we can further explain. Um, so if we use that chat feature, you could also use the raise hand feature um, so we can bring your question into the space. We would love if you could remain muted until call the bond, just uh, it makes best um, video for the recording that we'll share out after this session. Um, and just kind of getting in touch with one another. You know, I'm a big advocate for building community. So if you wanted to share what you're working on and share your LinkedIn, I know a number of you have already connected, but for some, some of those new faces, would love for you to connect um, with one another and continue to build community. Um, you know, obviously we're focused here in the Sacramento region, but we have a lot of people joining us around the state, nation, and beyond. So we're excited to have that. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Brian to launch into our fourth session. So thank you all for being here and we'll get going. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks everybody for being here. Looking forward to another fun, interactive night. Let me share my screen. All right, now we can get going. So as Cameron said, tonight we are going to look at revenue costs, key metrics, and financial projections. And we're going to try and spend most of our time in that last section with, with Roger and some really good hands-on information of creating these financial projections and um, burn rates and break-even analysis, all these things that you most of you probably hate like I do to have to do because it's, it's not easy but it's very, very needed. So I'm looking forward to that. And so instead of some breakout rooms as we normally do, we're gonna have Roger take us through some great examples so that one, you can see how it's done right and two, be able to replay this and stop and pause and get good expert advice rather than uh, all of us fumbling through a breakthrough together. So here's our lean canvas. Today, we're gonna to hit these areas, the metrics, the strut cost, and the revenues. And as you can tell, we've pretty much done the rest of the boxes on the canvas. So next week, we will be looking at pitching your accomplishments and traction, what you've done to date in the market. So you can tell investors how great you are and put that into your pitch deck and then your ask, which will come from some of the information in the last section tonight. 
So revenues, you know, these two first sections, revenue and cost, are pretty self-explanatory, but there's some good information on unique variances between types of models, right? It's like, yeah, I know what a revenue, I know what a cost is, I know what my potential um, things I might want to put in there, but there's some nuances around some unique types of models. So we're going to look at some of those. So revenue streams. Most of us think of basic transaction, but don't forget about recurring, right? So you know, whether you have a Zoom account like I do here, recurring monthly, you know, LinkedIn account, um, a lot of obviously apps that some of you are making probably are going to be a subscription based, or you can just buy an app, right? So are you doing one or both? Or do you have a roadmap starting out, you know, 99 cents download in the future, you're going to go to a monthly, um, or is it usage based? So when we think about the examples over here, you know, an ass, uh, assets, right? You're selling something, right? Normally as a transaction, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm purchasing my hydro flask, right? That's a one-time purchase. But are there recurring things that could be around that? So think about that as you go to market, but it could be a roadmap. Usage fees, so like a Zoom, right? Maybe the more you use it, the more you pay. Um, subscription fees. Lending, uh, renting, leasing, obviously another way, whether you know, easy when we think about property, but could be equipment rentals, things like that, that you are renting or leasing. Uh, licensing, maybe you've created something and you, you don't have the channels and distribution to get it to market yourself, but you want to license it to others who have those channels, whether it's a you know, original equipment manufacturer and you're going to license them the ability to, to add on to their uh, products. A brokerage fee is another way. We think of things like, um, you know, credit cards, real estate agents, those are broker fees. And advertising, we don't think of that normally as a revenue stream, but it, it is, right? You're not actually, you could rent billboard space, but the advertising itself is a, a different um, animal altogether. So very unique examples. So let's take a look at an example of what a reoccurring and a transaction model could look like. So this is an example of Nespresso's business model canvas. So when they originally started, they started with just the Nespresso machines, right? Kind of like the, the Keurig, right? And they were selling it to houses, uh, households like you and I or office buildings. And it's just a one-time machine sale. That was their revenue stream, whatever that margin was, 20%, 100% uh, with your marketing and cost over here. So they sold it mostly through retail stores. Couple years into selling the Nespresso machine, normally in places like, you know, Sears and Walmart and places like that, Target, they said, how do we increase our revenues? And they said, what about selling the pods as a subscription versus a one-time um, purchase where you normally would buy them? So it took several years. That just didn't happen in year one. So they started looking at the pods themselves way before Keurig. And how do we make money on those? Someone's already bought the machine. They're not going to buy another machine. It's almost like a, a razor blade, right? And razor lost leader. Now let's try and sell those through either mail order, our stores, uh, online. Same people, houses and office buildings. But now we have a repetitive reoccurring revenue as well as the one-time transaction revenue. So you don't have to do these at the same time when you go to market. You could have a roadmap. Let's get some foothold, get some traction with whatever that thing is you're selling. And then maybe you have an add-on later on for recurring revenues. So pricing mechanisms. We usually think of fixed, you know, list price. Here's, here's what I'm offering. Here's what it costs. Sometimes that could be feature dependent. Um, the more features you want, obviously, the, the more things are going to cost, especially when you think about things like a car, right? Okay, you want you want this feature or that feature is going to be more. What about segments? So that's an interesting one. Some of you might be looking to sell into the public sector, state, county, federal government. That could be a very different market. The federal space selling to them for one price versus selling to um, the county or city for another price. Economies of scale. Normally, the federal government has what they call favored nations pricing. You can't sell it to anyone else anywhere in the world lower than you sell it to the federal government. 
So you have to be aware of these things. And you know, knowing that, do you even sell into those segments? So how do you price those things? What are your margins? Volume dependent. Uh, that's an easy one, whether it's uh, something that's consumable, you know, raw material, uh, or how many you're selling just a, of one thing. So then there's dynamic. What would that look like? Well, it, you might not think of it as a pricing mechanism, but bargaining. The easy one's a flea market. I mean, how many people have gone to a flea market or uh, just be honest, you go to Mexico and you're haggling with the guy on the beach who wants to sell you the sombrero and you're like, I'll give you 10 bucks. And he's like, no, it's 20. And by the end of the day, he comes back and you guys meet somewhere around 12 bucks. And so, you're, you know, it's the same uh, concept going to the flea market. That's dynamic pricing. You're bargaining. You probably aren't going to have that, but may maybe you do. Auctioning is another dynamic pricing mechanism. When you think of auctioning, think of eBay. Uh, I go to eBay all the time. So how many people have bought stuff on eBay? So that's an auction site, right? Um, can also be considered a marketplace, which we'll, we'll talk about. And the way that they're selling things sometimes is do auctioning. Sometimes, you know, you have that buy it now button, right? Which would be a marketplace. So it, maybe it's a five day sale and, you know, Ray bids a dollar and I bid two and Cameron bids three and just keeps going up till the end of the thing, right? Market dependent. How many of you have gone to Ruth Chris or, uh, you know, Morton's? and you go to look at you know surf and turf and it says market price well that's the price that lobster right now is going for is it you know 10 bucks a pound is it 30 bucks a pound so they're not going to put a price on their 50 bucks if they're barely making any money because lobster price went up that year so that's a market dependent price some of you maybe you're playing in that space depending on what you're making right if it's a uh, obviously some sort of technical product an app you don't but if you have some physical thing or it's some uh, like lobster some or some raw material that you're very dependent on the yield you know things like wheat that year or oil it's going to be market dependent yield management is an interesting one think about hotel rooms or airlines so an airline seat price and we probably have all experienced this and get frustrated you know, if you're booking something maybe two months out, you get one price. You know, maybe it's $49 on Southwest. Well, if it's the day before the flight and there's only one seat left, it might be $199. And you're like, what happened to the one to get away price? Well, that's yield dependent because there's only one seat left. They're not going to sell it for $49, right? So the availability of inventory, whether it's a hotel room, an airline seat, or even things like agriculture, like wheat again, what was the yield that year? There's not enough of that thing to go around. So therefore the price is up or maybe there's oversupply, so the price went down. So this is a, a good a little example of a freemium, which would be one of these kind of uh, feature dependent type things if you're looking at it from that point of view. So Flickr, which is, the, here's the business model canvas for Flickr. They first started out as a free basic photo sharing app. Who were they targeting? Well, casual users of um, photo uh, sharing. A very free, limited, basic account. Think of just like Zoom here, right? Many of you probably have Zoom accounts that are free and you time out in 40 minutes, right? Because you're not paying anything extra. Well, once they get you hooked in and you see the value of their product, then they're looking for people who are the higher level users, need more storage, need more features, um, whatever those things might be that they want more. So now they're gonna upsell them to a premium photo sharing, high volume users, and an annual subscription in this case. So a freemium, you need to be careful you definitely want to make sure that you have what is that next step that you think people are going to pay for and hopefully you validated that they will pay for that once it gets there but you built the mvp that is get getting traction now you're getting users and then you can you know do those kind of step up to the next level We've talked a little bit about this in past weeks, but just a little visio. Most of you 
are probably looking at the direct model of your business model type, right? You're going to sell direct to someone, a distributor, a consumer, uh, whoever it might be, an OEM. Some of you might be in a marketplace. Well, what's a marketplace? Well, think of just Amazon or even eBay, right? Amazon's a marketplace. You're going to go there to buy things. Amazon doesn't make anything. They don't make the books that they started with selling. They don't make the, you know, hydroflask I might have bought there. They're a marketplace for buyers and sellers. But a multi-sided, many of you might be building a multi-sided business model. What does that look like? Well, think Airbnb, think Uber, think, think Facebook. You're bringing together two or more groups of customers. There's only value if there's both groups present, right? And that's the hard part of a multi-sided. If it's all uh, Uber drivers and there's no Uber passengers, doesn't really do any good, right? If there's only Uber passengers, but nobody wants to have you use their car to take anyone anywhere, it doesn't work. You are facilitating interactions between these groups if you are acting as a multi-sided platform vendor, right? Facebook did that. Uber does that with drivers, passengers. Airbnb does that with um, you know, renters and people who own houses. And it's called a network effect. Users attract users. And normally the goal then later on is those users attract advertisers, which is where you're going to make some money. But you've got to have both sides to it. The key with this one is the question always is, well, gee, which side is more important? You know, the, the supply side or demand side. Honestly, the supply side is the most important part you have to have first. If you get a bunch of demand side coming in, but there's nothing to buy, you've shot yourself in the foot. They're probably not going to come back. You have to have something that, you know, that's why they started with Airbnb and the guys in San Francisco started with just their place. Okay, we have one place to sell. Let's go find a user. Let's get five of my friends that want to sell, rent their rooms. We have demand. Let's go five, find five more customers. Same with Uber. If I got five cars, great. Now we've got some supply. Let's go out and market, find the users, and we can continue to grow. All right, let's move to costs. Cost structure. So cost driven or value driven? When we think about this, think about high under low end normally. In most called you know, red ocean, really competitive industries, cost is a big deal, right? Everybody wants to minimize costs, talk about lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, which is all about efficiency. You're trying to drive down costs and you're really competing in many cases on cost. Um, a lot of those think Southwest and JetBlue, Costco, sometimes just competing at the low end of the market on low margins, Kmart and Target and Home Depot, right? Or are you value driven where you're really trying to create a leap in value, um, offer a much higher price because there's a significant differentiation between the next and the market. You have a lot of features. Tiffany, Ritz, you know, Carlton, high-end services, high-end products that there's a much more significant value. The other thing you can think about for value-driven, we touched a little bit on Blue Ocean the other week. If you're creating a new market, which many of you as entrepreneurs think you are, or a new market space, you can change the rules of the game. You're changing the barriers of your market Right, you're entering an old market. Here's how they compete, right? Draw walls around your, your industry. Most entrepreneurs think that they're creating something new. They're breaking through those barriers and you're finding new space. Well, if you are, you can create value, but still drive a high price, um, but have low costs. And we'll talk in the next few slides about how to do this because cost and value are different, right? Your cost could be really low you could still have a really high price. So now you're getting great margins because the people buying that thing see huge significant leap in value versus what else is out there as an alternative. So if you're really rewriting the, the boundaries and rules, you can have a high price, significant high value, but a really low cost. And that's obviously the creme de la creme, which is hard to do. But as entrepreneurs, think about that. How are you re rewriting the rules? 
some characteristics when you think about fixed costs that's the easy one right you know your rent um salaries manufacturing site you know our cost structures variable costs um think about you know the the you know easy ones that uh, um might change from month to month it could be your utilities or gas or things like that but there's some other ones other examples that are really interesting when, I, when you think about it things like music festivals so if you are a service or an experience that you're starting as an entrepreneur you could have significantly different costs depending on how many people come to your event or the size of your event right so if you've got a uh, 10,000 people event versus a hundred people event significant variable costs depending on how much uh, size of the venue and fencing and you know all these other things you need to have so depending on the thing you're creating really take a hard look at those variable costs especially when you look at the next two economies of scale and scope as you scale up do those variable costs stay in line or do they start to really decrease as you scale up um, economies of scale is bulk purchasing, right? We think of Costco and Home Depot and Walmart. That's economies of scale. The more you purchase, the lower some material is going to get for you. Economies of scope, think of conglomerates like PepsiCo. You know, PepsiCo owns, you know, hundreds of products, right? Not just Pepsi. So vitamin water, um, other sodas, other beverage types. So even within some sort of something you drink, a beverage, there's many, many categories. Their vertical integration of distribution, HR, finance, uh, manufacturing, all these things gives them economies of scope across all of their businesses. So they can lower those costs because they have these different you know, business units, so multiple products. So you might obviously take a long time to get there, but maybe there's something that you're playing in and some partnerships some um, distribution or oems where they might have economies of scope that you can leverage so we talked a minute ago about looking at some costs that are very innovative and creating new space and value driven well think about skype how could they significantly change their cost structure what are game changing cost structures well if you can leverage something that other people are paying for or that's already created you have a significant cost structure advantage right skype said we're going to use the internet just to deliver our new product so there was no infrastructure they didn't build any infrastructure whatsoever and used the internet for their new solutions so they didn't build any of that. Like, you know, use, let's use the uh, phone company, PacBell, you know, any of the other cell companies, all the infrastructure they put in. Same with Netflix. Over the top um, streaming, they use the fiber to the house or the Wi-Fi, the internet that was already there created to sell their services. They didn't have any cost associated with bringing fiber to your home or my home or using, you know, satellite. Uh, piggybacking somebody else's stuff. Uber, you know, what was their game changing cost structure? Well, they didn't have to buy any cars. Their, their taxi companies have to buy and maintain all these cars, right? They're like, let's get rid of the biggest cost in the entire industry. Let's make people use their own cars, you do their own maintenance. I mean, it's those type of thinking that you need to think about how can I significantly reduce my cost? change the rules of the game I'm playing in so that I can have a, a significant bigger margin, uh, but also deliver new value. This is just a visio of what that could look like, right? Here's our lean canvas cost side, our, our, um, our value side to the customer. So the question is, what are these things that are value creating or driving cost on this side that we could either eliminate reduce, raise, or create, right? That's that blue ocean strategy. You know, you're competing 
in this to draw a box again around your market, your industry, that you think you're doing something better. What are those common factors that have been competed on for years potentially that maybe the new customer you're going after could care less? Can you eliminate those factors, which eliminates your cost? Can you reduce your cost by really de-emphasizing those things? And can you raise value by really emphasizing certain other things that you think are more important and you know, create new value with new offerings? So don't just think about competing in the same old way, think about competing you know, in a new way. So metrics and traction projections. So when we think about metrics, a lot of us and me included, sometimes we'll think about internal metrics, um, which is, you know, I need to, um, my, my product needs to be able to act like this and I need to be able to decrease, you know, time by 50% to make you know uh, it worthwhile and valuable. I need to be able to um, prove that what I say is true. Okay, gee, the, the hydro flask. An internal metric would be, um, I'm keeping this beverage cool for 24 hours. I might use that in marketing or it's going to withstand, you know, 500 pounds of, of pressure or something else, right? That's not the metrics we're talking about. We're talking about traction and revenue metrics. What are the customer facing metrics that are proving that you are making progress towards making revenue? That's the metrics we're talking about. And I'm a lean canvas, that's what we're talking about. And we look at those through what we call pirate metrics. And this is what a lot of the accelerators and startups now and, and lean stack lean canvas use and yes it's funny it's called the r metrics right which is why it's pirate metrics r matey so acquisition activation retention revenue and referral these are the five metrics that most accelerators and lean stack use and we're going to go through an example of what these look like so you can understand how these can help you look at are you making progress and are you stuck in, in a bottleneck in one of these areas? Whether you're pre-MVP, pre-revenue or not, it doesn't matter. So acquisition, well, don't think of it as actually acquiring a customer. It could be acquiring a prospect. Who is even my prospect I'm going after and how do I even find those prospects? Customer problem fit is an example, right? Um, I've gotten, a group of people I think are my targets. Great, what's a metric that I can use to figure out, are these the right people and am I actually making progress in proving that what I have is what they need and want? Well, if you're creating an app as an example, downloads would be a great way to look at this or just visits to your website. How many people went to my website? Activation, how many people actually created an account and logged in or came back to your website? Retention, you know, monthly active users, session frequency, are they coming back? Are, are you retaining them? Was it just, yeah, I went there, but I didn't see the value of never going back to that site again, which is what I think a lot of folks have happened because we're not at problem solution fit. People will go to your site. They're like, oh, that sounds interesting because of, of a marketing buzz, but they're not coming back or activating or creating revenue because they're not really seeing uh, that value proposition aligning with their problems. Referral, that's an obvious one. How many people are referring you to somebody else? And then revenue is the big one, right? At the end of the funnel, is it generating revenue? Are they, what's your average revenue per user? Customer lifetime value we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, ad revenues, all these different things. So when we talk about metrics, how are you walking people through the funnel from prospect to paying customer and retaining them? And if, if there's an area where you're losing them, that's where you need to focus on. 
So what's, what's an example look like? Acme company gets a thousand visitors a month to their website. So that's acquisition. Uh, and you might think of that as a, a, a misnomer, a misterm, but you're, you're, you're acquiring prospects, visitors. Your activation or conversion is 70%. So you're getting around 700 users a month to actually maybe create an account or send you and say, yes, I'm interested in more information or come back. Um, 700 of those people, only 20% of those users are coming back after the first visit. So they've, they've created a login, but only 20% are coming back after that first visit. That's retention. That's only 140 users. So out of those 140 users, only 10% are paying, actually generating revenue. So that's 14 out of 140, 14 customers a month. Out of all those users that came to your site, 10% are referring people to you. So a thousand visitors, you get, you're getting 14 potential users. That's actually not too bad. So the question is, you know, if you're getting a thousand people coming to your site, great. But if you're only getting, you know, one paying customer, Somewhere between activation and retention, there's a problem. The value prop, the messaging, you're not hitting their problems. You haven't validated their problems well enough to have a reason for them to buy your thing. They're interested, but not enough to give you their money. Here's some examples of some metrics from a marketplace side. We'll look at both passengers and drivers for Uber and just this box here for metrics. So. What would, what would be metrics that Uber London passenger, they would look at from the passenger side? Well, how many apps were installed by passengers? How many accounts actually got created from those apps that were installed? How many journeys were booked? How much money was spent on trips per month? And how many users were referred? So that is the R metrics right there. And you kind of see that funnel that really helps them understand how they're walking people through the funnel to create traction. From a driver's side, Uber would look at how many drivers did they interview? So prospect. How many drivers joined the service? How many trips did they complete in a month? How much revenue was generated? And how many new drivers did they refer? And if the metrics seem off in one of these areas, that's where you got to focus, right? That's your bottleneck. In this next section, we're going to actually show a Visio we call the fact <clears throat> that shows how we can really focus on that from a visual perspective. All right, so traction and scale. How can we use these pirate metrics to help create a roadmap for scale and show projections? You might have seen a little bit of this slide before, a variation. If not, most of us are down here in this problem solution fit area, right? We are trying, we're at zero. We are trying to validate that we have problem solution fit. Uh, we've done customer interviews and discovery and observed things, found our early adopters, we believe, and we think we have a problem solution fit. We're trying to you know, get the MVP out. We're trying to prove product market fit, and then we're trying to scale. Well, how can we do that and use these pirate metrics? This is where the customer factory comes in. Think of this you know, whole funnel as really a, an automated factory where you're getting people in, and through that cycle, you're creating revenue, right? You, you need to treat this as a factory becoming efficient at it and seeing where your bottlenecks are. This is part of the Lean Canvas and Lean Stack platform that uh, if any of you are interested in, I'd be happy to talk more about it um, and really uh, do some one-on-one -on -one time with you. But what we first start with is this minimum success criteria. When you're looking at your business to start with, you need to have an idea of what does success look like? If you, are you trying to make a million dollars a year, hundred million, a billion? Um, is it just a 
business that you want to do just to have a living for yourself and you want to make a hundred grand a year, whatever minimum is, that's what we need to start with. Otherwise, what's the point of doing the business? If you can't figure out how to generate your minimum success using real pricing models and real metrics, you're, you, why even spend the money and time to build something you know is going to fail? So then we say, okay, great. Maybe this is an example on the next slide. Call it $10 million. What's your pricing model? Step two. Even before you talk about these things, step two is right now, what do you assume you're going to charge? Is that a $10 a month subscription or is that a $100 one-time transaction? Whatever that thing is you're selling. You have to have some idea of what that looks like. Because then what we do is we say, okay, how many people do we need to drive to your site or to your store? Because we know we're gonna get a small percentage of those people to actually be interested in what you have to offer and an even smaller percentage to actually give you revenue and maybe stay for one to three years if you're lucky and maybe refer you a few people. With, once we know all of those numbers, you will know exactly how many people you need to get to, some people are gonna cancel, what's my lifetime value? Those pieces of data are really important to show your investors you know what the heck you're talking about versus I'm gonna get 10% of the market share just because I think I can. Well, they can't stand hearing that. So next week you'll hear from do's and don'ts. That's one of the don'ts. It's complete garbage. No investor wants to hear, I'm gonna get 10% of the market share because you know, I just think that that's you know, doable. Well, why not 20? Why not five? How'd you get 10? Just because it doesn't sound too offensive. Um, that's not good enough. So here's what an example looks like. In this example, we're saying this company, their minimum success criteria is $10 million per year. If they can't get to there in three years, maybe it takes them four or five, but if they can't get there, they're not interested in doing the business. Period. That min that's a minimum, right? So if that's too high for you, great, lower it. Their revenue model is $29 a month for this thing they're selling. So at the end of three years, they need to have 28,736 customers buying something at $29 a month. That equates to $10 million a year in revenue at the end of 36 months. That takes into account cancellations, referrals, new customers that just joined, plus your existing current customers. These are real numbers that you can show an investor to say, you know, we're starting here, you know, and do it in increments. We're going to show the next slide of what that could look like. But here is my real factory with conservative numbers, not 50% referral rates and 50%, you know, activation rates. By month 36, year three, you would have a total of 510,800 visitors to your site. 51,000 of those, just 10%, are going to actually be interested in what you have to sell and, and sign up for something. Only 10% of those are going to buy something. They're going to stay with you for three years, and maybe that's a long time. Maybe you change that to one year. Um, and only 10% are going to refer somebody else to you. That equates to that 28,736. So all of these are levers you can pull. Is 10 too low? I think it's 20%. You know, three years is too high. I think that's one year. You know, this is too low. I know I can get 15%. Well, then that will change these numbers. But these are real numbers that are you want to be realistic and conservative. So you can tell an investor, here's exactly how I can get these numbers, take it into account who doesn't stay with me, how long they stay the price of my um, goods, all of these things. That then goes into your traction roadmap. I personally love this and put this into all of my pitch decks because they're real numbers that show exactly the mirroring of this 10, call it 10x scaling, which means we are gonna grow year over year by 10 times. Well, you say, well, that's crazy. That's really, really high, Brian. Well, if you think about it, the beginning of any startup takes a lot longer to get money than you think it's going to take. If you have a two times 
scaling roadmap, you would have a line that goes like that, almost straight up, which is almost impossible. You know that you're not going to have one customer this month, two the next month, four the month after that, eight the month after that. That's two times scaling. But it's going to take you a lot longer. So we're saying by in the end of year one, I'm going to have 288 customers. Well, it's going to take me a while to get there. But once I get there, I think I can double that three times during the year, which gets me to 2874 for year two. Then you see the big hockey stick. Well, that's 10x. 288 to 2874 is 10x. Well, 10x again is 28,000 customers. 28,000 is your 10 million a year. So this is a realistic hockey stick that starts out much slower because it takes you as an entrepreneur a lot longer than you think it's going to take. So here is slow growth. You're not failing because you didn't get, you know, every month twice as many customers. But once you start going, that 10x really shows how you can scale up once you get to product market fit down here somewhere. So I'm going to stop there with the, my area of metrics and financial projection from a really an investor pitch deck kind of perspective of where you think you could get to and turn it over to the more important part of tonight, which is Roger and where the rubber hits the road of that's great. We think we can get to this many customers. What does that look like from a break even unit economics? Um, burn rate, how much cash am I spending each month, Mr. Investor, and, you, and I'm asking you for a million dollars, and how you can calculate those things that needs to also be in your pitch deck versus your revenue projections. So before we pass to Roger, I want to stop ask if there's any questions here because we covered a lot. I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions, and we can always do that at the end as well. If you have a question, it look like, looks like there is one. Um, so the question is, is product market fit when all the key metrics in the funnel fall into place? Um, what more tips do you have for product market fit in this current economy and where demand seems low? Yeah, good question. So when the metrics are all working together, that's actually your MVP, right? You know your minimum viable product is sold to your early adopters in here all the way really until here. Um, and if, because we go back to that diffusion of innovation curve, you know, right, we're at the very beginning. Our early adopters are all the way from here this way, right? The rest of the market's over here. We've got to make sure that those metrics are helping us even get early adopters to get MVP revenue. Once we get early adopters giving us money for something, that MVP, then we keep evolving the product to get product market fit. Product market fit is not is, is to the rest of the market. It's not to your early adopters. They're already bought in. Product market fit are additional things that you need to build onto the product that the rest of the market seizes enough value for them to buy it. So you, you can continue to use the metrics to make sure you're scaling correctly you're not missing the mark with them but you still need those metrics just the same for your mvp to make sure you're not missing something so we have a couple of questions that came in to me brian um and one's related to kind of consulting so i think you'll be best to tackle this um sh should the question is shouldn't the number of customers depend on the price um and maybe a this is referring to her own example, but uh, 52 customers as a start for a consulting business, training other organizations seems like a lot. So if she was using that math, um, maybe for, um, she was using price maybe as a particular lever um, to get to a minimum success criteria. Yeah, I'd have to see your certain example. So if, if you're a consultant, and you have this exact same model, that's what you would have to do. But as a consultant, to get $10 million a year would be that's quite a lot, especially a sole proprietor. So yeah, you'd have to do these things at $29 a month, which I don't think is doable. So you need to change the levers to more like, you know, 12 
$190 a month, which would more be a more normal, re, you know, uh, retainer price for consulting. Um, that's going to obviously lower this significantly, right? Depending on how long somebody stays with you. So yeah, you need to pull all those levers and the platforms that we use. Each of these is changeable, which changes this dramatically. And maybe it's only a million a year you want at $1,209 a month. That's going to change all these numbers significantly, right? So start with what you think success is, because if you think as a consultant, it is 10 million, then you're right. It's impossible. You're never going to get there. So you got to figure out what do I got to change. Yeah. So the minimum success criteria and working backwards from, from that. So yeah, setting it up as a $10 million operation, um, you know, you'd either have to empower other consultants to be a part of it. Right. And that's where you're looking at models like a Deloitte or yeah. or something. Um, so one question was uh, more tactical to the graph and I, um, is where is the red line to referrals on the graph? And it took me a second, but it's at the, at the very bottom, you can very kind of bottom. see they're each, um, uh, each color is represented for like a new part of it to get to that total. Very, range, very so. small, right? You're not getting many referrals in this example. So if you go back and say, oh, I, I, I can get 25%. Okay, change it to 25%. And that line is going to go up here towards the blue line, right? Uh, it's going to be a much higher percentage of how you're getting revenues. So all of these numbers are levers you can change if you think that's too low for you, even has cancellations, right? So the yellow is the cancellations, um, which is probably, you know, use an industry norm, 3%, 5%, you know, what's the average rate of cancellations per month, per year in your industry? Any other questions? You can shoot it in, shoot it to me in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. Going all right. Well, I think that's all we got. We'll be transitioning over to, to Roger. If you have a question, feel free to put it in there while we're transitioning over. We're more than happy to, to take those. So, um, Brian, feel free to unshare and then yes. Roger will take it away. And Great questions. Roger, are you going to share the deck, or do you want me to? Share? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was, I was, I thought you guys were going to share it, and I can I click through if you share it. Does that work? You'll have to tell them to click through, which is obviously. Oh, not okay. Awesome. My my apologies. I um, wasn't no right. worries. No. Um, all right. Well, appreciate everyone taking the time uh, here this this evening. I know it's late, and uh, I'm guessing most of you probably saw a Banker talking about financial projections here, and figured I got to get me some of that. So thank you for uh, for taking the time. Um, but it is it is an important and, and critical piece of of what we're talking about here and what we're building. Um, you know, in in the framework of of everything we're discussing here and, and building the pitch, you know, the financial projections are going to be a key piece in determining what that ask is. As you're looking at, at Brian's, you know, traction chart there, uh, you know, hockey stick growth is, is rare and oftentimes not realistic. And having that long ramp up period in the beginning, that requires capital. You know, that's going to require someone to invest in the business and, and have some patience as you ramp up operations and so we'll be we'll be talking about how to project that out tonight and, and kind of what that looks like. And that ties into the concepts Brian talked about regarding burn rate, break even, some of that. Um, but, you know, outside of just getting to a number for the ask, what someone's going to need to invest there, there's a couple key takeaways that, that I want you guys to, to walk away with tonight. Um, first being, uh, we're not going to learn how to actually build a full model tonight. That's not gonna be something that you're walking away with. We're really looking at the underlying concepts and ideas on how to get started and how to build a realistic and defendable model, um, which investors are gonna to wanna to see. They're savvy business people, they're gonna dig in, they're gonna to wanna to understand your assumptions and where this is 
all being driven from. So we'll, we'll talk about kind of the strategy and we'll, we'll get into some uh, specifics and tips and tricks on building a model, but we're, we're not gonna walk away from learning that. Um, and, and I apologize, I just lost my remote desktop too. So, sorry. Uh, uh, so the other uh, key takeaway here is gonna be um, that these tools are not just for investors. Um, yes, you're going to want to ship with an investor to determine what the ask is going to need to be in terms of investing in your business. But if you're building your model just for an investor, you're really losing out on a lot of the details and, and value that you're going to drive from this. Um, you know, the, these, these models are really going to be an important tool for you and, and what you're building and, and being able to tweak that. Um, I apologize. I am not able to log into here. Um, so anyways, um, so it's, this is, this is really also a tool for you more importantly. Um, and we'll get into what that means here shortly. Um, there's a few key terms. Um, I'm calling it the lingo here. People will use these different terms uh, interchangeably, um, but they can mean different things. If someone's using forecast or projection, meaning something else, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it's helpful to understand what they, they could be talking about. Um, first being here, I'll start at budget at the top, working around this clockwise, the level of uncertainty in the, the model increases. So a budget is often a short term, usually 12 months, uh, really used for an established and existing business, um, can be used primarily for goal setting. Let's say you're a face mask manufacturer today. You had a great year 2020. You set a budget on where you want the business to go in 2021. That's a budget, uh, a tool for management to work towards. Goals and compensation can be based off of it. Um, but it's, it's really where you want the business to go. Slight difference from the forecast where the business is likely going. Uh, doesn't always necessarily align with where you want the business to go. A uh, face mask manufacturer in 2021 could be looking at a vaccine saturation mid-year thinking, oh, sales might actually drop off here. So what does that look like? Um, so forecasts, you're, you're building in a little bit more uncertainty um, into what that, that could uh, look like in the future. Um, moving on, uh, projection is where we're gonna spend our time this evening. Um, projection is typically a longer term deal, multiple years, and it's really focused on what will happen if we do this. And I think a lot of you are going to be in that position. What will happen if we start this business? What will happen if we acquire X number of customers? What does this look like for the long term? Um, so as I said, as you work through this, a little bit of uncertainty um, increases as you go through these stages or these different terms. Last one's a pro forma. We're not going to spend a ton of time on that tonight. Um, that's really adjusting a historical uh, financial for a future event. So something like an acquisition, um, those lines looking at what a future event could have an effect on your historical numbers, um, which we're, we won't spend too much time on that this evening. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Brian. So key question, uh, why do I need a financial projection outside of, as I mentioned before, determining what your ask is going to be for an investor, how much capital you're asking them to invest? Almost more importantly, this is going to be a tool for you. So um, outside of predicting success, um, you know, it's fun to see how much profit you think you're going to achieve and what your cash flows are going to look like. This is something that's really going to help you plan on a month by month basis, for example, timing a cash flow. If you have a seasonal business, let's say you are uh, a ski resort, for example, you're going to have a very long period in the summer or fall where you're not generating much cash flow. So you need to be able to understand that um, and, and plan around having peak cash flow cycles, understanding seasonality. 
you know, resource acquisition. When are you going to need to invest in more machinery or servers? You know, what is the timing of that? You don't want to invest in these things too early and spend that money too quickly when you don't need to. You also don't want to lose out on opportunities for sales and growth because you don't have the infrastructure in place. Um, and also things like personnel planning. When are you going to need to hire new salespeople, IT, admin, you know, a, a well-built model is going to help you as a, a business owner uh, really understand the operation of the company. And, and that's going to be driven by the process of building this model. Um, it will also go through this process, the research that would be required, the understanding that you're going to have. It's going to make this a much more defendable business model and projection when investors are, are questioning you, um, which is equally as important. Uh, next slide, Brian. Oh, back one, there you go, sorry. The, the, yep, external. So internal uses, very important. You're obviously gonna need to use these for external purposes. This could be any version of investors, bankers, lenders, um, and each one of these categories, they're gonna require you know, different things from the model. They're gonna be looking at different metrics. You know, friends and family may be interested in you know, when are they gonna get paid back? Uh, me as a banker, I'm looking at cash flow and how quickly can you pay a loan back and what the leverage profile is, what's the risk that I'm underwriting to. Uh, other investors may be more patient. You know, they, they understand that ramping up period, cash flow may be negative in the beginning. They're looking at you know, what the terminal value is, what the exit strategy, you know, when do they get their returns. So a well-built model is going to be able to be used for multiple different external groups as you work through the life cycle of the business. Um, so next slide. Uh, the, the underlying basis we're going to talk about here tonight is unit economics. Um, and this, this is really a good projection model is gonna be based on a few key drivers. You're gonna have many assumptions, but it's really gonna be drilling down to a couple of key drivers that I, you know, ideally you're gonna be able to tweak those couple drivers and have those changes flow through your projection model. So you can think through different scenarios. You can project out different you know, sales strategies. You can project out different cost structures tie in those revenue streams, cost structures, and generate the key metrics from the lean canvas. Um, so, you know, unit economics is really going to be the foundation here. Um, if you could click that once, Brian. So here's your, your kind of basic your dumbed down in income statement, revenue, cost of goods, which is your direct costs, operating expenses, depreciation, fixed costs, and then you result in the net income. So nice, nice little business, you know, 50% net profit margin is, is healthy, but this doesn't really tell the whole story. If you could click one more time. Now, this same business, exact same income statement, uh, you could be you know, building a, a used Honda Civic in your garage, sell one unit, make a nice profit, may not be uh, you know, something that's attractive to an investor, that specific business model. Uh, could you click one more time, please? A uh, different scenario, lemonade stand. Now you're selling 3,000 units, exact same income statement, but those revenues, cost of goods, expenses are spread out over many more units. Tells, tells a very different story here. I saw a question for uh, cost, COGS is cost of goods sold. Uh, those are direct costs directly related to the, the sales activity. So manufacturing, it would be... Uh, materials and labor directly related to the production of a good or service. Um, and the, the core to this unit economics piece is those direct costs are gonna vary with the unit volume. And we'll, we'll cover that here on the next slide in a minute. Different than the fixed costs. So marketing and sales, uh, general and administrative, that could also include salaries and labors, but those are expenses that you're gonna have to pay regardless of uh, unit volume, for example. So you can sell 10 units and still have the same marketing budget. You can sell a thousand units and theoretically have that same budget. Whereas the direct cost, the cost of goods sold will vary based on that, that unit volume. 
Does that help answer that? Uh, good. It does. It does. Thank you. Right, I, was, I was really trying to get from you whether or not uh, salaries are included in COGS, because sometimes people include salaries, other times they don't. Yeah, uh, and, and it depends on who you're paying the salary to. If it's to someone who's in marketing um, or administrative, not directly tied to the production of the service that could flow into that fixed operating expenses. If it's a salesperson um, who's you know directly involved in the sale of uh, a product or a subscription, that, that's likely gonna fall into cost of goods. So there is a gray area. Um, and a lot of CPAs and accountants for tax purposes can also play in that gray area. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. So the, the point here is two completely different stories, exact same income statement. So getting down to the unit economics is gonna help you build a, a better model. It's also gonna help you tell the story to investors and, and defend your, your projection and your, your business model here. So we'll, we'll look at a, a couple examples of how these unit economics uh, flow through a growing business here on the next slide. Roger, there, I got a private question um, for uh, what about sales and commissions? Would that be related to COGS or would that be in the um, just the other you know, costs? Yeah, likely a, a commission will be directly related to cost of goods um, as a as you sell a unit, you pay a commission. Um, I have seen people put, you know, sales staff in uh, fixed expenses. Um, so a lot of times it's, it's a question on what your, your CPA or accountant is recommending that you do. Um, but in general, a commission that's tied directly to a sale is going to be a variable cost and, and should go into that cost of goods. Perfect. Thank you. All right, if you could click once, thanks, Brian. Um, so exact same income statement here, um, just for continuity, 3,000 units, like in that lemonade stand. Top section here is an abbreviated version of the income statement. Bottom section is the equivalent unit economics. So here's your startup looking at, as you start growing, as you start gaining some traction, units increase. Now you're selling you know, 5,000 glasses of lemonade. Your, your fixed expenses there, which could be rent, uh, machinery, any of those things, likely gonna stay the same. You should have some scalability that will allow you to sell more glasses of lemonade without increasing those fixed expenses. But what you will see is cost of goods increases. Now you don't have, you're not selling at a volume yet where you can gain some economies of scale. Um, you know, your, your supplier of lemons isn't gonna give you a discount for the big difference in units there. Um, but what you can see is the fixed expenses get spread out over more units. So down below highlighted in blue there, you go from 42 cents to 25. You're now getting more net income per sale of glass of lemonade just because you're selling more and those fixed expenses didn't increase. So now let's look at what happens as you continue to scale, you get more traction. Now your vendor's taking notice. You can start negotiating. You have some buying power, negotiating better discounts. And here in the yellow, we show the, the cost of goods. So the, the per unit cost of a glass of lemonade as it pertains to those direct costs goes down. You start recognizing those economies of scale. That flows down to the bottom line. You're now selling... 10,000 glasses of lemonade, your fixed expenses there still stay the same um, and you're, you're making more per glass. Now, eventually you're gonna need to uh, increase some of those fixed expenses, whether that's buying another location, investing in more you know, lemon squeezing equipment, uh, you know, maybe investing in some more administrative staff. So those fixed expenses are going to go up if you want to keep selling units. Now, the benefit is you're going to be selling more glasses of lemonade. So ultimately, even if those costs increase, you're likely going to see another improvement in your per unit profit uh, by selling additional costs. Now, the one thing to uh, warn you of is Investing in, in those fixed expenses, uh, that's tough to come back from. Brian, if you could click one more time. 
So, you know, let's take, for example, someone trying to sell lemonade in the Midwest today uh, with the current uh, weather patterns, probably not doing very well. If they had, you know, bought more locations, invested in more equipment, hired potentially more people, uh, and then the, the volume of sales suddenly hit a slowdown, it's hard to backtrack that, that fixed expense, that 2,420 there. So you can see what happens to your per unit income when you run into a slowdown and aren't able to scale those, those fixed ex expenses back. So this is a, a, just a portrayal of how those unit economics flow through as you sell more or less units and kind of how it plays in with expenses. Understanding this is gonna be important as you build your model um, because you're gonna be forecasting out or projecting out multiple years and, and taking into consideration some of these changes. But at the, at the end of the day, this helps tell investors the story of where you're taking the business and, and will ultimately be the level of detail that investors expect. You can do the next slide, Brian. So lemonade is a very simple uh, example. You're producing a good and selling it. I'm sure a lot of you are looking at service and subscription-based businesses. So unit economics in year one don't necessarily tell the whole story. Uh, getting someone to sign up for a subscription in year one is going to yield benefits potentially for years to come, which is why we look at these two concepts, which are lifetime value and customer acquisition costs. Lifetime value being the total amount of revenue per customer for the lifetime uh, that they are a customer, and the acquisition cost being how much money you have to spend to get your average customer. Um, we will talk about this ratio, the LTV to CAC ratio next, but you know, unit, unit economics will dictate that if you have a subscription-based business and you've uh, you know, put out the expenses to acquire those customers early on, your unit economics should improve as time goes on because you've already made the expenditure and you'll collect more revenue as, as time progresses. Um, so for a lemonade stand, getting repeat customers uh, might be difficult. Um, you know, cost is low to acquire customers though. Um, whereas if you have a fruit juice of the month subscription, you might have to spend some money up front to get those customers, but that reoccurring revenue stream, you know, is, is gonna be more valuable as time come, come, goes along. So the LTV to CAC ratio, it's basically just the ratio of total value to the cost to acquire that value. Uh, every industry is different. So it's important to use benchmarks. Uh, you can use public company information and, and other research to try and help establish those benchmarks. But the important fact is, you know, different industries are gonna have different ratios um, and different business models are gonna have different ratios. Overall, if you have a ratio over one, uh, you likely have stronger unit economics. The higher that ratio is, the more value you're generating per co the cost to acquire that value. As you approach closer to one, you're, you might be experiencing some business stagnation. That means the, the ratio of value to cost is getting one to one. At some point, that will result in a break-even scenario where you're not making any money if you're exactly at one. Um, and then if you see that ratio fall below one, it's, you're in a situation with poor unit economics, it's actually, excuse me, actually costing you more money to acquire a, a customer based on the value of that customer. So you might need to relook at your business model, your pricing strategy, your cost structure, any number of those things to help rectify that. So at the end of the day, unit economics, as we'll see here shortly, is, is going to be the basis of building a solid model and really telling that story. But for your internal purposes, there's a number of benefits. It, it helps to expose gaps hindering profitability. You can identify, are your costs higher and as it per, uh, pertains to cost of goods sold and those direct costs? Is your your fixed expense structure too high? Do you have you know too much structure for for a, a newer business, for example. Uh, you know, it helps you calculate what reasonable expenses might be for your model and also evaluate the potential of, of your, your startup business and the cash flows and the profit. Um, and ultimately, 
it's going to help us build a model that you can use to to pitch this business to investors and, and hopefully get some capital to get these off the ground. So a very, very valuable concept, very you know, basic in, in the thought and just what you're making and spending per unit, but uh, very, very critical, critical ramifications as we move forward. Um, so now that we've covered that, let's talk about you know, actually building a financial model. Um, the, so there's a, a many, many different types of financial models out there. Uh, Brian, if you could hit the next step, there you go. Uh, here's three of the most common ones. You got three statement model that refers to your income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Uh, these other two, you'll see very frequently discounted cash flow models, merger and acquisition models, very complex and likely overkill for what a lot of you guys are, are focusing on. Um, you know, we'll spend time talking about the three statement model. Um, this will likely be all the horsepower that you need to generate uh, the, the metrics that we're looking for and help sell these businesses to investors. So just want you to be wary or be aware of all the potential models out there. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but simplicity is key here, both in building the model and, and using it, as well as being able to articulate what the model means to investors. So some, some best practices um, as you're thinking about starting your projection, how to project out this business with all these moving parts, you know, focus on the unit economics. At the end of the day, the volume, whether it's subscriptions, new customers, you know, manufactured units, you know, whatever you're producing, whatever you're selling, it, it's going to be driven by that volume. So drilling down everything to a handful of key drivers, number of units, revenue per unit, and then some of those costs per unit are going to help you build a, a, a more defendable model and really understand your business better. So that's why we spent so much time focusing on the unit economics. Uh, another key thing, and, and you'd be surprised how often we see that hockey stick projection and you know, kind of head in the clouds projections, be realistic, you know, all the stuff that, that Brian was covering earlier, especially that traction scale, that's, that's real. It does take a long time to build a customer base. It takes a lot of activity to drill down to a few customers. So the more realistic you are up front, the more useful this model is going to be both to you internally, as well as to investors. Um, as I mentioned, this is a useful tool for yourself. Update it regularly as things change as your assumptions change, maybe you find a lower cost provider, maybe you adjust your marketing strategy or pricing strategy. Um, having a model where you can tweak a couple few fields, a few drivers and have that flow through your model is gonna become incredibly valuable as a management tool. Um, and as you kind of dial in, you know, what this business looks like. And then the last, the last key thing is keep it simple. Um, you're going to have to have enough detail in there to be useful and to defend this against, you know, investors questions and, and help them understand the business, but you don't have to have every single little cost, you know, you can lump things together, um, you know, use simple assumptions that are defendable. Um, you know, if you have 50 different products, you can use averages, you can use some other assumptions. You don't necessarily have to list, all 50 products, each one of the prices, how many units, that could be helpful to do on the side, um, have a separate schedule for that. But simplicity is key, both in having a working model as well as being able to talk through it. So these are some just some, some key best practices as you're starting to formulate you know, what this projection looks like, what this business looks like. You can jump to the next one. Um, so to follow up, there are some best practices as I'd, I'd recommend using Excel for this just to the functionality. Um, as I mentioned, your model should be driven by unit inputs, having a few fields that you can change, you know, a sales growth metric that then flows through the model or changing your per unit uh, cost structure that flows through the model is going to be very valuable and save you a lot of time so you don't have to update a lot of different things. It, it all is automated using formulas, um, which is the, that next bullet point. So having things 
flow through as you change them. You can save multiple different uh, projections scenarios. Um, you can have a, like as a banker, I always like seeing the client's case. I will create my own bank case off of that. We'll also want to see a downside case. What's, what's the worst that could happen? So having a working model helps with analyzing different scenarios. I also recommend keeping all three of those statements, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement on one Excel sheet. It's simpler. You don't have to have different sheets linking to each other. You're not flipping back and forth between uh, different sheets and just makes the modeling and formulas simpler. Um, a common practice in, in financial modeling is to use different colors for various cells. So blue for an input cell that you can type into, black for a formula driven cell that, cell that you're not supposed to change, um, just helps you move through it quicker and, and reminds you what to update, where the drivers are. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases with a more robust model, they'll use green that shows that something's flowing from another sheet, but not necessarily applicable here for what we're talking about. Uh, using error checks, so you're gonna have a balance sheet, putting something at the bottom that will zero out if your assets equals your liability and equity is gonna save you a lot of time and a lot of embarrassment down the road. So having a few error checks built in, just so uh, as you're working through your model, you've got something that uh, you know, double checks your work is very helpful. And then lastly, goes back to the assumptions, the drivers, which is kind of the key theme here. You know, clearly separate those so that when you show this to a, a potential investor or a source of capital, they can understand what your assumptions are and how you're getting to your profit, to your cash flow, and what's driving this business. Because um, that's, that's what they're going to be interested in. How are you getting to the numbers that you're getting to? Roger, I had a question come in. Um, so the question is, uh, when you say driven by unit inputs, are you suggesting that these are on separate worksheet or within one of the worksheets? And you'll probably show um, us here. Uh, it depends. Second. Yeah, it depends. I'll sometimes put those assumptions on a separate uh, worksheet just to highlight them, make it, you know, clean it up and, and make it really easy to read. Um, you know, you could also put those at the top of, you know, you could have your your assumptions up top and then just, you know, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow that all flow beneath it. So it's all in one place. They can look at the assumptions based on each monthly period. Um, so it, it depends on, on how robust your model is. Um, and, you know, I, I would recommend having a, just a separate table for the assumptions, whether that's on a different sheet or in the same sheet um, that you could then, you know, clip and put into a deck so you can focus directly on the assumptions when you're, when you're pitching this to, to an investor. Awesome. Um, yeah, if there's any other questions, feel free to shoot them my way. Okay. So next slide, uh, back to assumptions, can't hammer this home, um, you know, good for modeling ease of use for your own, uh, you know, uh, peace of mind as you're going through this. Like I've, like I've said, allows changes to flow through automatically, quickly can address multiple scenarios and also just helps build model integrity. If you're using assumptions and everything flows through, you're not having to go through every column, every cell trying to update stuff. It does it all automatically. So it retains that, that model integrity. And then again, like we just talked about, uh, being able to summarize those provides user end user transparency and helps you to uh, better defend your model and the underlying assumptions. And then on our last page here, uh, just a reminder, um, this is based in accounting. So you have an income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. These are all going to tie together. So changes in the balance sheet are going to affect the cash flow statement. Items that appear on the income statement are going to flow through both the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So making sure that as you're building your your projection and your formulas that these all interact with each other. You know, a, a collection of accounts receivable is going to flow through the cash flow statement. Uh, selling a product, you're going to see revenue. If you don't collect right away, you're giving your customer terms. You're also going to see that affect 
accounts receivable as well. You know, net profit's going to flow into your equity section. So, you know, these are these are all kind of tied together and they work almost as, you know, gears working together in a machine. So it's just important to capture all of that using your formulas. Um, whole another class involved in actually how to build this out and factor all that in um, into Excel. There's a lot of models out there that, that you can use for that, but um, you know, it's important to have all of that flow together um, so that your model updates as you make changes to those drivers. All right, so I'm going to do a, a screen share um, instead of you know breaking you guys out and putting you through the the, the pain of, of trying to develop uh, your own own uh, uh, model here. I was going to take this opportunity to uh, come over here. Let's get rid of that. Okay. All right. Can you guys see the, the Excel sheet that I've got here? All right, perfect. So a couple of things we're gonna touch on with this is we'll tie in the, the unit economics. Uh, I'll tie in a few kind of quick tips on navigating Excel, um, a few shortcuts that I use that I think would be useful, um, how this kind of flows down to a net income. And then uh, we'll, we'll turn this into how to kind of look at a, a burn rate um, and build a graph that can be used for a, a pitch and to adjust, you know, cash burn, break even analysis, kind of runway that you have with an investor's capital. Uh, so, biggest tip I can have for getting more proficient with Excel is the le less that you can touch your mouse and have your hands on the keyboard longer, uh, the faster you're gonna be. So I'll, I'll use my mouse a little bit here just to kind of point some stuff out. Um, but being able to navigate your Excel sheet uh, with just your keyboard is gonna be key in speeding things up. So uh, combinations of shift, control, and alt, as well as arrows and page down, um, all useful. So holding down shift, holding down shift over here, you can press your arrow to the right and select various cells. You can go down. You can also jump from written text to written text by holding down control and go down. You can jump big spaces. A lot of times when I'm building a model, I'll actually put X's next to key things. And it almost works as kind of a quick access. You can go here and jump up through various pages. Um, so kind of a, a cool way to navigate. Um, so if we were gonna, let's use this, this lemonade stand example and say, you know, let's, let's project out 10% sales increase per month for the first year. So starting with a thousand, you know, you could hand calculate this and, and say, you know, 1000 times you know, 1.1 1 .1 and, and get that answer and do that for every single cell it takes a while. Some of you may go all the way out and, you know, you can use equals, select that thousand times 1.10, oh, that's 10%. If you do hold down control and hit enter, it'll populate that same formula across all the cells that you have selected. And you can see here, each one has taken the prior cell. So, it basically, my calculation D4 times 1.1, it goes to the next cell and automatically selects E4, then F4, and you can see that 10% growth month by month. So a nice, cool little trick, you can select all that. Another way to do it is you can have a driver. So I created that to be a percentage cell. You can now take your entire model, change that, multiply it by this cell. However, as you saw in that last one, if you do this, it's gonna move those same two cells, each, each one down. So it'll be D4 times C4, then you know, E4 times D4, then F4 times E4, which is not gonna get you the right answer. So a quick way to do it is using F4, puts those dollar signs, that's gonna lock the red cell, both the column and the row, and so it'll basically take each one of these columns, multiply it by the prior one, which in this case is D4, in this case it'll be E4, but it'll keep that 10% the same. Control enter, and it didn't work, sorry. <laughs> this, 
And that's probably not a percent. Well, ah, that's so trial and error. F2 to go back in. We are basically dividing by 10% there. So you need to have one plus that to get to the 110%. There you go. So now that you have your total number of units, using that same concept, we can generate revenue assuming our $5 per unit. So we take the unit, multiply by your revenue. We're going to freeze that revenue cell again. And now you have your revenue at $5 per unit for each month. Cool thing here is you can now say, well, what happens if we only have 5% growth each month flows through? What happens if we only make $4 or sell these for $4 that flows through? So you can now change your, your model just based on two inputs, which is really useful. Uh, control Z undo, undoes your changes, also very helpful. Uh, control Y will repeat it, so if you want to toggle back and forth. Um, there's useful guides. I'll, I'll send one around. I'll send one to Cameron that he can uh, send out to the group uh, after all of this, just with some common tips and tricks. So we're just going to speed this up a little bit here. Uh, these are the direct costs, materials, labors that we talked about with cost of goods tied directly to the unit volume. So same concept, we're gonna tie it, lock it in with that red cell, generate per units. Same thing, go up and just repeat four. So now we have our direct costs. Another key trick here, um, you could use the sum feature, you could do you know D8 plus D9, uh, various things, or you can do alt equals. So you hold down alt, you hit equals, it will then just automatically sum up each one of those rows. So it's essentially doing the sum feature, but it's two presses of a mouse, it sums those up. And then just to wrap this up, equals using control to toggle up this, your revenue minus your cost of goods, you have your gross profit, gross income right there. Now we have fixed costs, which don't change on a per unit basis. So if we're gonna assume that these just stay the same, we can just project that out. So this is going to equal 1000. If we use the same F4, it's gonna lock that one cell and you're gonna end up with 1000 across the board, which we don't want. So what you can do is toggle through F4 and we're gonna lock just that uh, that column by putting the dollar sign in front of the C. So it's going to lock whatever's in this column, but allow it to change by row. And so basically anything in this row is going to lock to that. Anything in this row is going to lock to that. And then we can do the, the same alt equals to get a quick sum. Uh, got, a, got a little depreciation in here. That stays the same. And again, all equals. You don't want to do all equals here because it's not going to capture everything. So this is a simple one where you can just do this plus this. Control enter to apply that same change across the board. And I have this built so it automatically just finished with net profit there. So quick way to, to build a model here. Um, another key piece of tip I like using is up here in the right, you have your quick access toolbar. The nice thing about this is if you hit alt when you're in Excel, it comes up with keystroke commands. So I'll put a lot of things that I use up here very frequently, a lot of formatting and other items. Um, I put some borders up here for an example. You can also use this if you hit alt H, it opens up this home tab and assigns a code. So you can, you know, uh, do any of these by just using keystrokes. So if I wanted to, to merge and center the title just to make it look clean, Alt H, 
M for merge, and then C for center. You can drill down into all these. It just sends it right to the middle, merges all those, makes it look nice and clean. If you wanted to have, for example, some sum lines, you, know, you can take this, go to the end, and then I use my quick access up here for an upper border, Alt-7. And that should put a nice border there just to kind of help. Oops. Alt-7, and you can repeat. Another cool thing that, that you can do is if you just hit F4 after doing a formatting, it will apply that exact same formatting some, somewhere else. So if you're just doing this over and over, you can select F4. It'll do that same top border the last thing that you did. Last thing here is it is helpful to, uh, to know what you're going to do in an entire year. So you can use that same alt equals. You got a, got a formatting issue there. So let's just make all that into dollars. And you can actually just sum everything up like that. So good little example of the unit economics, how you can do a couple of different drivers to drive a whole projection and how that all kind of floats down to the bottom line with some useful tips to speed things up and, and it, quite frankly it's all just it takes a little bit of practice um so now that you have your your model built uh you can we're going to build a chart so i've just structured this to to build out kind of some chart inputs uh, are you able to zoom in on that one just since oh yeah my apologies no you're good so we're going to talk about burn rate, which is how much cash you are burning. So when you come back here, this is all negative net profit. This is money that you're burning through until sometime between September and October, you're able to start turning a profit. Your gross income is able to cover your fixed expenses. So your break even point where the, the loss turns into profit happens here. Now you're not break even for the whole year. But you can point to an investor and say, hey, I'm going to need enough cash to get me through to September up front, at which point we're going to start generating profit. You know, might still need some cash to keep things going, but we'll be able to start generating profit and, and you know, get this business going at that point. So this is this is your burn rate, what what cash you're burning through um, before you start turning a profit. Uh, this also dictates your runway. It's how much money that you've received from an investor, what you're burning through. That's going to give you an idea of how many months you can make it off of the, the capital that they've invested before you have to start turning a profit. So that's burn rate and runway. So I know I said don't put things on multiple sheets. In this case, it will work out because we're doing a graph. So this will be driven off of the the projection that you built over here. Um, again, it's all just gonna be linking. So we're gonna take our 12 months equal. We're gonna go back to our income statement, select that, control enter to apply it, and you've got your burn rate going across the tabs here. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, how do I get to the ask? You know, Let's let's just assume that that you know twenty twenty thousand dollars for this business is what you think your capital is going to need. Calculate your runway. You're going to take that twenty thousand, subtract the burn rate for that month. Oops. Uh, if it's a negative, let's do this. Minus that. And because that is causing problems for us, we're going to make that a negative number just for clarification here. So this shows now how fast you're burning through that money. So after the first month, first month you're going to have $15,000 left or $16,000. According to this, $20,000 isn't gonna be enough to get you through to where you can start turning a profit, which is this year right here. So here's where you can start playing with that number. Do I ask for 25,000? Now that does get you there, because at this point you start making a profit, you start getting money back. 
maybe 25,000 is the right number, gives you a little bit of cushion for the, for the unforeseeable. Uh, so a really simple example of how your cash burn rate affects your runway based on what your ask is. So as you develop your projection model, you can establish what that burn rate is. So you can then turn to the investors and explain to them why you need the capital that you need. Um, now, you know, this is not the most attractive chart, so you can turn this into a graph pretty easily. You select the, the data inputs, and we can go up here to insert. Excel has got a nice function where they recommend a lot of pretty charts. Um, in this case, what we'll do is a combo chart which shows a line chart for one piece of data, a bar chart for the other piece of data, and then you've got your, your month as well. And in this case, oops. And I've, I've got a, a prettier version of this that I've kind of doctored up and, and cleaned up a little bit, but in general, this shows you your runway here. You can see the point of inflection where you hit break even and start being profitable. And then this shows the burn rate, which is improving. You're burning less cash each month as you ramp up operations. Uh, any, any questions or anything before we kind of go back to the, the deck and, and, and wrap things up? Any Excel tips, questions, navigating this? Anything come up, Cameron? So not yet. Um... Thanks for sharing those tips and tricks. Those are definitely lot, new, so. new to me. And I um, never knew all just how you could do it on the keyboard. So um, yeah, are there yeah, any- a lot, a lot of cool things. If you're a, an Excel geek or nerd like me, you get excited by that stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, hey, if you're living in it, um, as long as you're still excited about it, that's a, a good thing for sure. Yeah. So. Um, so we're getting some good feedback on the, the cheat sheet. I know, are we going to be able to share this uh, Excel just for people to use as a, a model going forward? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Happy happy to do that and, and happy to be a resource kind of after the fact. And like I said, I'll, I'll distribute a uh, an Excel cheat sheet. Um, unfortunately, mine is printed out and it's in the office, which I'm not going to at the moment. So when I get down there, I'll, I'll grab the cheat sheet that I typically have and keep in my desk and, and kind of highlight a few things and share that. So I'll send that to you, Cameron. You can circulate that to the group after the fact. Perfect. Um, so yeah, we will be sharing this Excel template that you can play with um, and, you know, start looking at kind of some of your own unit economics in that space. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away, or if you would prefer, you're more than welcome to send it to me in a chat or to the group. So we'll give a second. I think I had I had one last slide if we want to throw that back up um, just to show kind of what a, a clean, nice looking graph of that 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 burn rate chart on the next slide here. Color coded, of course. So here's a cleaned up version showing what your your runway is. Uh, so you have your initial investment. You burn through that. In this case, 12 months isn't enough. So. They're, they're still burning cash as they get through 12 months, but they still have some of that capital left, roughly 75,000. So investors are gonna wanna see this analysis because they're, they're gonna wanna make sure that, A, you can achieve positive cash flow and profitability within a certain amount of time, but they're also not necessarily gonna wanna necessarily continue to invest if you continue to burn cash. So being able to articulate what your need is and what you're going to do with it's really important. Awesome. So it looks like we had one question come in. Yeah. Our and so, yeah, burn rate and runway are inversely proportional because as you burn cash, your runway goes away. Now you can re revamp your runway by getting more cash brought in. So there's second round and third rounds of, of fundraising and equity and various other things that you can do. But the, the best way to turn that around is uh, to, to generate a profit and be cash flow positive so you're not burning burning cash. Um, but you know being able to identify that timeline, you know you go back to the, the traction chart that Brian was showing. It, it can take a while to ramp up and hit that critical mass and become profitable and you, you're going to want an investor who understands that and be able to articulate to that because they're going to need to have some patience in the beginning. 
So making sure that you're on the same page and, and using these concepts can help. Any other questions, thoughts on, on any of it? Brian, did you have uh, kind of some, some last follow-up stuff that you wanted to touch? Or I guess, were there any other questions on modeling, projections, anything I can answer tonight? Yeah, gen general, we are we're, uh, open for any and all questions now. Okay. Going once. See if there's none yet. Um, oh, that was a lot to digest. <laughs> no, it's definitely, this is always one that, um, it's a lot of content, but one that's, you know, obviously very relevant and, um, you know, start thinking through those lens. You know, we, we start the program um, demonstrating kind of the three lenses of design thinking. So desirability, viability, and then the feasibility, right? And that's, you know, very much the feasibility is you might be building a solution, but looking at the numbers, okay, well, I need 10,000 customers in, in this amount of time, right? That's a, um, you know, a little bit more realistic and understanding how it all, all operates. One of the things that I would add on there and say is for many of you who don't think you can do the Excel and do these things, that's fine. I would take away the mindset that now you know the things that you need to get done, go find the person to do them, whether it's an advisor, part of your team, you hire a, a CPA for a couple hours of work that you need to get done. But at least you know now what the investor is looking for, what you need to understand, and just go get someone to help you build it if you can't do it. And then that kind of ties in with those key takeaways up in the beginning. Like, like I said, you're not going to walk away from this knowing how to build a perfect financial model, but understanding what goes into it and the strategy of building that and being able to simplify it down to a couple of key drivers based on those unit economics and then understanding what metrics you're trying to take away from that and what story you're trying to tell. That's really going to help focus you know, your, your attention and your strategy and, and get something that's useful to you as well as to investors. See if there's any. Um, all right. So having trouble knowing where to start um, because there's so many different product ideas in terms of assets, apps, strategy, and consulting. Um, so in kind of building out that mix of potential, um, you know, you showed us kind of the the unit economics of it, right? And looking at you know if you had an app and as well as some some services you had on top of it, right? You have to kind of break those units into. Um, their lifetime value and also their cost to acquire them based on that um, strategy as well. So I think partly defining, you know, from my perspective, and I'm happy to have uh, Roger and, and Brian say, no, I'm wrong in this area, but narrowing down to what, you know, is your initial offering, right? You're at that startup phase. So focusing on what your MVP and what you're actually prototyping versus building everything from the get-go, you can start to build out that roadmap, um, but I think initially starting with what the most basic component is and then building from there. And it, it might help to go back to that, that lean canvas because the best place to start is your revenue streams and your cost structure. You know, that's, that's the basis of unit economics. So if you're, you're looking at your revenue streams and figuring out, you know, how am I pricing these, these products, these services, and, and start thinking about the costs that are associated with delivering those to the market. You know, that's, that's the basis of the unit economics. Once you have that, the rest of the model can start falling into place. Now there's gonna be number of other assumptions. I, when I'm doing my own financial projections for, for my job, I'll, I'll start with a couple of those key drivers, um, you know, units, revenue margins, that's the basis. And then there's a number of secondary, uh, you know, assumptions that I'm, that I'm making on various expenses, capital expenditures, distributions. There's other drivers that affect the balance sheet, like, you know, AR, accounts receivable turnover days, inventory turnover days, how long are we 
uh, you know, projecting that, you know, cash conversion cycle. And those are going to drive changes in the balance sheet that are based off those revenue numbers. So there's varying levels of assumptions that you can get really down into the weeds. But as you're looking at the baseline here, you know, start with those revenue streams and, and the start of that cost structure and, and focus on those unit economics and then build from there. I will add in to, to that, which I'm, I'm glad to, you positioned it that way, Roger. One of the things that I think historically entrepreneurs do is you build things first and then you try and figure out what you can sell it for and you try and find out where that problem is. What segment does this thing I've built fit into and how much can I get for it? And that's incorrect in the last four weeks that we've been talking about, right? That's not the proper way to, to go about entering something into a market. First, we got to figure out on the right side, what's the problem and, and what is this you know, desirability from a design thinking standpoint? What's the customer need, right? What are the problems for this customer? The second piece is not the build piece. Nowadays, the thinking for best practices is what is the customer willing to pay to solve that problem? That's step two. It's not what do I build now and then figure out what they'll pay for it later. That's, that's not correct. The thinking nowadays, the best practice is I know the problem. I know what they want. What are they willing to pay for that? If you don't figure that out, you are probably going to fail because you're going to be building something that you don't even know what your margins are. So if you figure out the problem, you figure it out they're gonna pay because of insights and customer interviews and gathering data, $29 a month, great. Now you know what, what the revenue stream, what the you know monthly is. Then you go back and figure out, can I build that thing for $29 a month to solve this problem? That's the last thing you do is trying to build that thing once you know the problem and the revenue that someone will pay for it. That will save you a lot of headache and bankruptcy probably because that's usually why startups fail. You're building stuff nobody wants or that you're building it and you have to get so much for it because it's cost you so much to build it. People are like, yeah, it's too expensive. So if you can't build it for what someone will pay for it, then don't build it or change what it is that you are delivering and offering. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right, so we got one. How do software development costs fit into the model? Roger, you're muted, just FYI. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's gonna be part of that upfront cost. It depends on and how you're accounting for it. So. Uh, that's likely going to fall into those, those fixed expenses, um, the operating expense. If you uh, expense that all up front and run that through the PL just as a one time expense, you're going to see that up front as a big cash burn. Um, now, sometimes if that's a large expense, you can capitalize that as you realize the value of that over time and it creates an asset on the balance sheet, which you can then expense over time and deplete. Um, so it goes back to quite a bit of uh, accounting involved with that. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, software development up front, that's cash out the door up front. And so that's, that's likely gonna affect that cash burn. Um, and that will need to be factored into uh, you know, what the ask is. I, and I'll add another perspective, a different lens from not from the finance, but from the business. So let's say I'm building an app. Well, what if I decide to outsource the build of the app and I hire a third party offshore to build it all at once and get it done? Here's my cash burn. It's a million dollars to build the app. Now I've spent the money, but I have the app versus, gee, Mr. Investor, I need a million dollars and I have a team, we're going to develop the app over the next year, and that's what you're using the money for. So as to Roger's point, you're accounting for it differently, you're burning it differently versus I've already found a vendor who can build this for me, and I'm doing everything else and, and sales and marketing. So what is it you're doing? 
if you are you the techie guy that just wants to build it um or did you are you doing something else but you've got this main code that you've got someone else to build right all right so we have one more question i think it was related to your um, comments on the the lean canvas and focusing on the problem um, a lot of entrepreneurs say anyone can build a business find your passion how do we approach problem solving when we know what our passion is first if that makes sense and so i think partly if you're passionate, I, I would say be passionate about the, the problem. That's how we um, started our, our series is love the problem, not the solution, right? And so I think, you know, partly when you look at purpose, it's not necessarily just to build something to build something, but to build something that solves a problem and a need for someone else. Um, and so I kind of tapping into that part um, of, your, uh, of your passion. So I don't know if that answered it um, for you or if anyone else had any thoughts on that, but that's how I would approach it. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. You're you're picking an industry or a thing that you want to potentially solve the problem for. You think you have the skills to build, but what is the problem you're you're creating something to solve? Um, if it's just something you like to play with, well, that's called a hobby. And hobbies don't make money. Hobbies cost money. If you're building a business, you need to find out what the problem is first you're solving. Otherwise, people aren't going to pay you money for it. Alrighty. The next question is, um, uh, they're working on a multi-sided platform. What would you say the best way to monetize it would be? And so I, th um, I think looking, you know, I would start at other multi-sided platforms that, you know, mirror, um, your own type of business model, um, and kind of look at where, uh, who's your customer and who's your user, um, you know, in terms of multi-sided platform, I think of, I don't know if is uber a multi-sided platform right and so who actually bears the right. the cost of that um you know a lot of times it's the you know us that's asking for the ride doordash is a little bit different um and things like that right and so finding out where where the value is and who's willing to to pay for it right and that's part of that customer development process of defining the user versus the customer multi-sided is harder you've got two sides you've got to find out their problems, right? What's my problem as a potential Uber driver? Well, I, I want I want to make more money. I want to make some extra cash on my time as I see fit. That's my problem. So how, how are you solving my problem? You are telling me you're going to bring me someone who wants me to take them somewhere. So you've got to find the problem for both sides. So it's a lot harder. Great questions. All right, any more questions? If not, we will wrap up and get you out of here on time. Um, so I'll start kind of doing some announcements. If more questions come in, uh, Brian and Roger, if you don't mind looking for that, that would be great. Um, I shared some links early, earlier, um, the first one being Mentor Sacramento, which is an online mentoring platform, which I highly recommend plugging in. Um, it'd be a great resource for you to connect to mentors. I mean, if you're, actually, if you're passionate about mentoring as well, you can mentor. Um, we are running a four-part series called the Social Innovation Series that launches on March 5th. Um, a great way to plug in and learn about how to start a, a social venture. Um, definitely sign up for that. That would be a great program to tap into if you're working on a a social idea. Tomorrow, we're going to be running a workshop with uh, the Sadel Trebovsky, who's the CEO of Open Grants, and that's our grants for startups. That's at 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. He'll be going over how to access grants, uh, as well as the freelance guide to, to being a, a freelance grant, grant writer. We also have an Ask Me Anything with Rashawn Davis, who's an entrepreneur made at Sac State. He's the CEO of Unseen Heroes. And then the last few links are, we offer virtual office hours. So feel free to plug into that and um, share what you're working on. And you know, if you're doing the worksheets that we're sharing each week, we would love to work through those with you and answer any questions you have. We have a weekly newsletter that goes out with all the events and activities to plug in into in the, the local ecosystem. And lastly, we have a bunch of resources and recordings of other workshops um, on our website. So definitely recommend checking those out. But that's all I got. And oh, we got one more question. 
do you know of some someone that offers fee legal aid to help review contracts? I do not. I don't know if Brian or Roger knows of anyone, but um, is that maybe free legal aid to help review contracts? Um, an idea I have is reaching out to uh, McGeorge. They might be, um, they typically need hours in working with a uh, business owner. So that might be a place to start. Yeah, good idea. Awesome. And I also call the SBDC. So, right, the Small Business Development Corporation has skills for everything, right? HR, legal, strategy, finance, and see if they have folks uh, who might, and SCORE is another great example. All right. So, um, the last thing is next week, we'll be back for our fifth and final session. We'll be tack tackling uh, pitching, accomplishments, traction, and funding needs. We'll be uh, bringing in a panel of investors and funders to talk about uh, the funding landscape. So one of them being um, Mariah Lichtenstern from Diversity Ventures, Chris Horton, who's with the Small Business Development Center, and he'll be sharing how to access traditional lending. Amy Purchase-Reed, who runs a fund called um, 10X, and then Sabia Das from Mon Moneta Ventures. So um, definitely come and check that out. Uh, we'll be doing a QA and a and then we open it up for questions from all of you um, to learn how to one approach investors and what they're looking for. Um, and that's, that's what we, we got in store for you today. So we'll be sharing the recordings, PDF of the slides, and uh, definitely plug in and share your worksheets that I hope you're all working on and moving your ideas forward. So I will, uh, without any more questions, we'll jump on in and have a good rest of our evening. Thank all right. You, Thank everybody. you, Roger. Appreciate you coming in Thanks, and, and sharing and teaching us all those tips and tricks of uh, one financial modeling, but also using Excel. So appreciate your support. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All righty. Have a great rest of the evening, everyone. Bye-bye.